Highball Bakers. I'm Gemma Stafford, chef, cookbook author, and host of the online baking show, Bigger Bolder Baking. Your regular host, Mia, is off this week, but you have me here for a special episode. This week, I am talking to Dahlia Dogmax Subra. She is an incredible chef, a cookbook author, and a food editor for Harper Bazaar Arabia, to name but a few things that she does. We met a few years ago in Dubai, and I'm really excited to introduce her to you. If you're new to the Need to Know podcast, then welcome. Make sure you subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Also follow us on Instagram for clips from the show. For right now, here is my conversation with Dahlia. I hope you enjoy it. Good morning, Dahlia. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm good. I, it's You know, I said good morning. What time is it there in Dubai? It's 8 p.m. 8.08. Oh, exactly. it's uh, 10 past nine. So I, I've got my coffee here beside me. I've just I've woken up. I've been up for a few hours and uh, I'm good to go. But it's lovely to talk to you. It's lovely to talk to you as well. I'm going to grab my glass of wine after this. So I think we're really <laughs> oh, yeah. on the opposite ends of the day. Oh, no. Yeah, but we're, we're, but we're definitely on the same page, Dahlia. With me, it goes wine to coffee. If, if it's not, if it's not one, it's the other. <laughs> so I, so I get that. Absolutely. Dahlia, you, so I just want to let everybody know we met in Dubai in 2019. Isn't that right? I'm getting my years mixed up now because 2020 was so crazy. And we met at a conference. We, we had a lovely time together. We went to a, a local restaurant in Dubai where we had some incredible food. I really... I gravitated towards you and I think I know why now just like taking a step back food for you and for and, I, and for me I think it's the same it's kind of our love language I I couldn't agree more absolutely absolutely I know um by looking at uh like following your Instagram and everything like you're you're a feeder like the way I am and the way I show love and the way I show appreciation and all that is the one thing that I do is like I know how to cook. So like I feed people, I want to make sure that they're like well fed, that they're happy and like that's the one thing that for want of a better word, that's the one thing that I bring to the table. <laughs> Absolutely and 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 your your food is scrumptious to say the least. So uh, <laughs> a good way of showing love for sure. Yeah. Um, Dahlia, you, I want you to tell your story a little bit, if you don't mind, just because it is so interesting. You have lived this incredible life in the food industry, doing a lot of different things. You were born in London. Uh, you are Syrian. And uh, you lived in Paris and you have a, a big, strong connection to Europe. Uh, I know your parents are still in Europe. Are they in Spain? Yes, they're in Spain. Yeah. So you've, st you've, you've had, you've lived this very interesting life. So I would love for those who don't know you and even for myself, if you could just go back a little bit and, and give us uh, somewhat of a, a, in a nutshell, uh, your story, just because it's so interesting. And I know everybody would be, would love to hear it. Thank you. That's, that's very sweet of you. I, uh, well, when I was younger, my story didn't seem so, uh, so lovely as I got older, it, it, you know, and, and you kind of look at the world differently. You realize something that you didn't think was so nice actually became a blessing. So my, um, my parents are Syrian. My dad left Syria because of the political situation back then already at age 17, he um, immigrated to Germany. And uh, this was post-war Germany. So there was a, more opportunities in other places. Um, my father worked and studied in Germany and then uh, set up his business in Germany. Um, really, you know, did four jobs while he was uh, studying, getting himself through school. And uh, he ended up opening a little gift well, it was a little gift store with Middle Eastern or Eastern trinkets and gift items, like things that we were kind of used to in the Middle East, like, you know, whether it was a, you know, a teacup, uh, uh, you know, these leather uh, seats and poofs, like a lot of things that are very, very common in the Middle East, but weren't really in Europe and, and definitely not in Germany. 
Um, so my father ended up opening 116 stores. Uh, so it was, it was, yeah, it was the, so the immigrant story that kind of ended up having a, a very, um, a very, you know, sweet ending in that sense. So when we moved, um, so we were in, my parents were in Germany. We then moved to uh, Paris because my dad sold the business and my parents had always dreamt of living in Paris when they were in Syria. Syria was obviously very closed up and, you know, you know, the dictator that is still in place was in place as well. His father was in place before. So it was very closed up. Parents moved to Paris. So I, although I was born in London, it was really because my mom wanted me to have a British passport. She realized that Syrian papers wouldn't get me very far. Um, Age two, my parents all became German. My parents became German. The whole family became German. We moved to Paris. Um, I was a bit confused, to say the least, because I was a Syrian kid who, you know, had this German connection and lived in Paris. And um, I was very much embarrassed about where I was from. So my my mom and my dad have a very strong Middle Eastern accent, and um, I ended up in a German school because my older siblings, you know, spoke German and everything. And I, I was, I was very uncomfortable with where I was from. The food I was eating at school was very Middle Eastern. So I would open up a lunchbox and it would be filled with, you know, garlic and pine nuts and yogurt. And, and I wanted the ham and cheese sandwich that, you know, the German or the French kid had. So I taught myself how to cook at a very young age because I wanted to assimilate so much. And, you know, my mom cooks fabulous Middle Eastern food, but she can't fry it, a Western egg, let's say. <laughs> and um, so I, I really got into food and food became kind of my therapy. It became um, just that world where, you know, I could play around and, and I was starting to play around with flavors. So I would take Middle Eastern ingredients and I would use them in, you know, traditional West, like a, a French roast chicken, I would, you know, play with Middle Eastern spices and, and so on. I am um, uh, living in Paris, I became obsessed with the US. I don't know, this is a, I'm maybe a bit older, but there is this series called Kegney and Lacey, which is. Oh, yeah. Do you remember this series? I so, do. We, I do. I, I, I know where you're going to go with this because just coming from Ireland and all of our entertainment our influences the majority of them came from the US and so I think it's one of the reasons why I'm here why I am here in the US right now but go on because uh, I, I, I have a feeling I know where you're going that it does play a big role in how you know like I think your story going forward probably how you ended up in New York but go ahead Dahlia sorry I'm jumping the gun a little bit <laughs> yeah yeah no but, but, I, but you're right there is something you know there's just something about, you know, American TV shows and movies and, you know, even though, you know, the rest of the world does them nicely, but I was mesmerized by these two detective ladies, you know, <laughs> um, maybe middle-aged, I think back then that's what I thought they were, but they were running up and down these New York streets and I was obsessed with those busy New York streets. And I, I told my parents, this is it, I'm moving there. And, you know, typical Middle Eastern fashion. They were like, no, you know, it's too far. I ended up moving there, put my head to it. And, um, and I, I moved to New York. I was 19 um, and I fell in love with the city. And, and actually, I think the only reason I came back is because I promised my father. So a lot of his um, siblings moved to the US and then they kind of never came back. So we always had this fear that I would just leave and, you know, stay in the US. And I think the reason I came back is because I promised him I would, but I, you know, I was, New York is the best city in the world for me still. But as I was in New York, I realized that people weren't, um, and this is 1998. So people weren't really as um, familiar with the Middle East. So there was a lot of preconceptions about, you know, oh, wait, you're Syrian and, you know, you're Muslim. So I'm, I'm, pro I'm completely non-religious. I have no affinity to religion whatsoever, but I am a born Muslim. So I think people were a bit surprised to see this, you know, this side or the fact when they'd see a tattoo, they'd be like, but why are you like this? You're not supposed to. So there was, 
there is, I almost felt like I had a duty to just explain where I'm from and kind of tell people that, you know, I know there is that stereotype, which it does, there is obviously, that stereotype is based on something, but there's really so many different types of Syrians and Middle Easterners and, 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 and the whole region is, is, is already, you know, people kind of put it under the same hat, but it's really not. Um, and food was a way of also kind of telling my story. Uh, ingredients were a way of telling my story or the story that people maybe didn't know about us being back home, like whether it was traditions or, you know, just the way we do things. Um, I woke up at age 25, 26, and I suddenly felt I've, I'm an Arab. I've never lived in the Middle East. Um, I need to go see what it's all about. And I wasn't going to move to Syria because that wasn't much fun. But Beirut, it was post, Beirut was just coming out of the war and it was rebuilding and Beirut was really happening. So, for example, Anthony Bourdain went to Beirut three times. It's one of those cities where you really don't expect it. But before now in COVID, because unfortunately now it's absolutely, you know, it's, it's a very heartbreaking story now. But Beirut was, you know, was the place that I wanted to move to. I moved there. There was really, there was either traditional, you know, Lebanese food or there was these big American chains, but there weren't any homegrown concepts um, that were things that I learned to love living in New York, whether it was a carrot cake or it was the cupcake craze back then because of sex in the city. Um, so I set up a bakery and cafe with a childhood friend of mine in a very artsy district of Beirut. It ended up doing really well. We opened up five locations across the GCC. So we were, we then opened up two locations in Dubai and Abu Dhabi and, and Saudi. Um, and this is back. So this is 2005. We sold the business in 2015, but this was kind of me coming back and bringing a little bit of the West back with me. Um, and then, so moved to Dubai to, to set up a uh, kitsch here. And then I just, started um, really, I started a food blog in 2010. I think it was one of the first food blogs in, in the region. Um, and from then on, it just went, I started writing for BBC Food and uh, for Harper's Bazaar Arabia, um, uh, published the cookbook and, uh, and then it's, and that's really, and I've been in Dubai ever since. And I think Dubai you know, Dubai is this fantastic place that, you know, I, I, when you saw, like, it's, it's wonderful, it's got great food. But I think what's also pulled me here is that it is really a place, it is a very Western kind mm -hmm. of lifestyle. Um, yeah. And, and it's a place that, you know, so I've called home for 15 years now. So, sorry, I can yeah. go on for ages and ages. So I'm gonna no, 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 this, this is great. But this is, this like, when we met in Dubai in 2019, we had, we were at a conference, so we were both talking. So our, we were, we only sat down with each other for a few minutes. And then when we went for dinner the next day, we did have a nice time to chat. Um, but a lot of your story... Um, that's why I want you to go into detail is that I, I don't know it. And, and for those listeners who don't know you and who are just being exposed to you, um, I, I feel like uh, we have very similar stories. Like I came from a country that was very much inspired by the United States, that um, a lot of our media um, uh, came from there. So we were seeing, so I wasn't, um, my show wasn't Cagney and Lacey, but it was... Um, we had, uh, well, like when I was in like a, a teen, we had like a show called California Dreams. I'm thinking I'm, I'm definitely dating myself now. Um, but we had a show called California Dreams where like these um, California kids would like go to this cafe and spend their whole day in a cafe and all these things would happen. But like Saved by the Bell, I just was like, I remember thinking that Americans are the luckiest people in the world. 
And I remember at a young age thinking that they are so lucky because they have like all of this opportunity. And I think similar to you, when I was, actually, I'll tell you, I'll tell you my story. My, my Cagney and Lacey was a movie. It came out in around 1987. You might know what's called Baby Boom with Diane Keating. It was very yes, much an 80s course. movie. Uh, Diane, like, Diane Keating at her very best. Uh, based in New York, uh, started in New York it, it, she ended up in Vermont um, she was a high powered exec nobody ever said exactly what she was but she was like a high powered exec in a, in a high rise in New York City <laughs> so like you know uh, you know that 80s uh, at the start of every 80s movie in New York where like the busy streets everybody's just going up and down and it's just like amazing but I saw yeah. that and I honestly it came out in 87 in Ireland, we always got movies later. So it must have been 88, 89 when I saw it. I would have been all of probably seven years old. And when I saw it, I said to myself, I remember as clear as day, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to the United States. I'm going to go to New York. I'm going to uh, like, I'm going to like be there. I'm going to, and then she was in Vermont, based in Vermont. I was like, I'm going to, she sold applesauce. Long story short, she sold applesauce. But I was like, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to move to America. I'm going to make applesauce. And that's just going to be my, my dream. And so I promised myself that at that age, um, honestly, I was around seven, that by the age of 25, which is so funny because you, um, you, you went at 19 years of age, but at the age of 25, I was going to move. I was going to be living at that stage in the US and I was going to marry an American man. And at 25, I did. I was I was 25 when I moved uh, to the United States. And it's just funny because I'm a firm believer in. I, I also am not religious. I'm culturally religious and I think a little bit like the way that uh, you might be, where it's like I grew up in a very religious country. So there is a lot of part. There's a lot of me that like when somebody tells me that, you know, somebody is not well or, or you know, something bad has happened. I'll always automatically say, I'll say a prayer for you because that's what you do, you know, but I, I don't necessarily pray anymore. Um, but there's culturally, yeah. there's a lot of, uh, culturally there, that it makes its way. It, it's part of your lifestyle, even, um, even if you're not religious, but any, anywho, I kind of went off there on a tangent, but. But that's um, very true. But, but you're yeah. absolutely right. But I, I think it is part of, I have, so I'm not religious, but I am very spiritual. And then there are things that kind of just always remain because they, they come from home, right? So when your mom, you know, tells you things as you're growing up, it's kind of almost comfort in that sense. So I do think, I, I see exactly what you mean. Yes, absolutely. The, um, I, I'm a firm believer in that your story is already written. Even from when you're a, a young child, um, like your 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 life has already set out for you. Your story has already been written, and I don't really know a more eloquent way to say that. But I think that's that's why I, I was going to end up in the U.S. I I traveled to Italy. I traveled to um to Australia. I was there for a while. I was always going to end up in the U.S. and I was always going to end up married to an American man. It was just that was the story, and that was the, my story that was written at a very young age. And, um, I, I just, I'm just, I'm saying that out loud for people because coming from smaller countries, coming from countries, um, that maybe don't, aren't exposed, um, or as open as the United States, you, you don't have as many things, as many opportunities and as many, um, things available to you. Ireland is a little island. It still is to this, this day. And, um, you know, nobody, if I had turned around to somebody and said, I'm actually, I'm going to move to the United States. I'm going to, uh, be a food personality, which I, I, you know, that was never my plan, but I'm going to be on TV. I'm going to, um, make videos where, hundreds of millions of people are going to view them. That seems almost impossible. But whereas in the US, like it happened for me in the US and yes, it very much is possible. And I'll actually just go back to that a little bit. I don't know, Dahlia, you can tell me if this was the same for you, but um, 
when I was moving, when I was 25 and I was waiting to get my visa coming to the US, I'd waited, I was processed my visa for like almost a year. It took me a long time to get here. And there was a girl who wasn't a friend, but I did hang around with her, said to me, um, would you, uh, uh, knowing, I knew that I was, I was planning, uh, I was moving to the US and she was like, would you not, um, are you sure you want to go to the US? Is it not too big for you? Maybe you should just go and work in Paris, which is, you know, very common for pastry chefs to uh, spend time to stage in London, Paris, uh, in Switzerland. And she, she, that's all she said to me. She said, is America not a bit too big for you? And it was, somebody asked me recently, what was the best advice I got and what was the worst advice? And I think that might have been the best and worst advice I ever got because that small mindedness and that um, like that way of thinking was just not me. And where are you going to get in life if you think like that? You know, and um, when she said that to me, a light bulb went off and it was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to the US and I am going to. Uh, you know, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to show you. And I could tell you that like now I'm living in Los Angeles. I am very fortunate to be where I am. I'm very fortunate to have had a good career. And that girl who said that thing to me is still living in this, the same town, the same small town in Ireland that I left her in 13 years ago, you know? So I, I don't know if, you know, because you've got, you've gone, uh, from the middle East, Oh, sorry, from Europe to the Middle East, uh, you've experienced the United States um, and so many different cultures. It's really interesting um, just how, how different people react. And like if you had thought like that, maybe you would not be the food personality, the entrepreneur, the uh, presenter, everything that you are today. I, I mean, you're, you're honestly, uh, you're absolutely right because I think I constantly still, so I've always been too Eastern for the West and too Western for the East. And I constantly want to push both of those envelopes. So I'm always the devil's advocate on the other side. So, you know, for, for people in the Middle East, Sometimes they think I push it a bit too far. So, you know, I will get, uh, I'll give you an example. Like I'll get comments where, you know, I eat meat rare and people say, you know, you, you're not allowed to eat blood, you know, and it's, it's, they're just really weird. People like to always kind of push you to react um, in a way that they expect you to write. So I, I've never... I don't really give any any importance to people who have small minds uh-huh. because like you said I think uh, you know it's maybe like a and maybe you you felt the same there's like an inner voice in you this inner voice that tells you what you want to do what you should do um it might work it might not but the fact that you kind of just really want to go and do it is for me you know, enough. As in, I wanted to come back here. I wanted to, you know, create this American style bakery in the Middle East. And in the beginning, and these are the big guys here. So Dubai Mall and all these places. When I went into these meetings initially, and, you know, I said, I, I wanted a location for the bakery. And they, they'd look at me, they said, what do you want to do? Like cupcakes and cakes. And like, that's all you want to do. They're like, this is not the US. It will never work here. And then I ended up opening up in a residential area because the malls wouldn't take the concept. And, and when we ended up doing well, these malls all came back and offered us spaces in the Dubai mall and the mall of the Emirates. So it's kind of, I think if, if you're convinced about what you're doing, it might take a bit longer. It might, um, you know, it, it might not go in the direction that you thought it would. But if you feel that voice and you want to do it, I think you will eventually do it. I absolutely agree with you. I think it's and and things like you know, is it too big? It just it just kind of eggs you on even more. Oh, oh for uh, sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I I definitely feel that, and I still feel it. I I will say I still feel it. I still you know, with 
you know, both ends of the spectrum. Um, but change can only happen if you kind of prove that wrong. So um, that that's just how I kind of take these things in life. Let me, um, I just want to talk about your bakeries, Dahlia, because... Um, they were such a phenomenon. Uh, exactly what you said. You took something from the Western world, from the United States, and you bought that concept to the Middle East. And it was uh, primarily cupcakes and cakes. Was that that was your specialty, right, Dahlia? And um, you opened multiple around and you around in the Middle East. And you were twenty five when you did this. Yes. So I we started them in. Um, so we started 2005. Yes, 2005. So I was I was 26 actually. I was 26 when we started them, um, yeah. and it was re- we 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 did it in an old Lebanese building. It was a residential. It was a ground floor of a residential building, and we kind of kept everything the same. So the kitchen was the bakery, and then the living room was like the cafe. Um, it was you know again it was the Sex in the City craze that kind of had gotten to the Middle East. So that helped us a lot. We So when we opened, um, I think Magnolia opened about probably two years after we opened. So there was, no which way. was great for us because it also kind of, yes, yes. So it rose so awareness you, wow. about cupcakes. So they opened here. Then there was Hummingbird from um, London that opened up as well. Mm-hmm. It was uh, it was a real craze here. But like you were saying about Ireland, it was just delayed. And I, you know, my my partner and I, we just took advantage of that delay. So we had seen it work in the states, and then we came here and did that um, and did that here. And and yeah, so baking is how everything started for me. Um, it's it's funny though. I will say so. I will say that having five locations also took a bit of the love of baking out for me because when we had that one location, I would go there at four in the morning, we would bake, I would speak to customers, you know, we had everything from marriage proposals to baby showers. You know, it was, it, it was, I, I loved what I did and I was doing what I love. When we had more locations, It ended up being less baking, less people, more really managing a business. So yes, we were growing and it was, you know, it was doing better. But personally, my favorite time of Kitsch was when we had just one location. And I kind of try to remember that going forward because, uh, you know, I, I started a food delivery concept that I kind of came up with in Dubai when COVID happened. When there was the lockdown and 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 um, and and I try to remember what I felt at different stages of having these bakeries, so that I kind of learn from them and 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 apply them to my new business, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's really amazing. I want to um, I want to talk Dahlia because you've you've they always say that you change your career. What is it like four or five times during your lifetime? Um, Similar to you, we've both stayed and worked in food and you still to this day, you have Dahlia's and um, your Instagram, which I love is uh, Dahlia. Isn't it just Dahlia, uh, Dahlia or is it Dahlia's Kitchen? It's Dahlia's Kitchen. The, it's fantastic. And there you get, I see, because I know you travel a lot. Uh, I know you were just in like, uh, was in North Africa. You you cook a lot for your kids, for your family. Like when you, I see you cook for your family and uh, like all the different dishes and like you're baking for them and everything. It's just, it really strikes a chord with me because um, that's, you know, family is, is a, a huge part. Like in Ireland, food, family, um, you know, wine, dinners, late, late dinners, all this sort of stuff, um, you know, sharing and celebrating. Like that's a big part of the kind of the culture that I came from also. I just wanted to ask you a few questions, Dahlia, because you did your first uh, business was a baking business. Um, what is, so people ask me this all the time and I don't know if I've got a good answer for it because I 
think I'm supposed to say something outrageous and over the top. They ask me, what is your favorite dessert? And every time they ask me, I go, oh no, because my answer isn't like, I don't think a very good one, but it's an honest one, which is like my favorite what dessert. Is it's, it's some, it's food that I grew up with in Ireland. So it's like rice pudding that my mom used to make. It's apple crumble that we used to have as a kid, like on, in the, you know, the dark, uh, you know, after school in Ireland in during the winter, it would be dark at four 30 in the afternoon, like dark lights out. And I remember like after school, uh, those evenings being like young and having like rice pudding, apple crumble, uh, apple tart, rhubarb crumble those things that my mom used to make those and then, great. oh they're amazing like even on no joke I had made two crumbles this week in my kitchen and I and um because I was testing recipes but still to this day like that's what I gravitate towards uh, also my mom used to make for dinner guests she used to do a lot of entertaining and she would make pavlovas and um I just to me a pavlova like just screams elegance, like fancy. It's very grown up because it was, she'd only make it when, when there was other grown ups coming for dinner. And, uh, I still to this day, pavlova is hands down my favorite dessert, like meringue pavlova, like whatever it is. It's just that, like the crispiness, the marshmallow, the cream, uh, cutting the sweet, the fruit on top. I am just uh, the biggest fan. So I'm just curious from everywhere you've traveled and, you know, the different lives that you've had in different countries, what is your favorite dessert? So I think very much like you, there is, so your favorite dishes are those that kind of remind you of comfort. It's really comfort food, comfort desserts. Yeah. I think, and it's very simple and very, actually, I think yours are are, are much more glam than mine. <laughs> if, if one last thing I would eat, it is, it's really simple. It is thin French crepes with, so very thin, buttered, with a sprinkle of sugar and a squeeze of lemon. There is something I love fried dough. And, and it's interesting because you've got crepe and you've got pancake and you've got fannikoken and you've got all these different, you know, pancakes, if we'd like, uh, in different parts of the world. And, and here in Dubai, you have, um, you have very interesting types of fried doughs and they're very different there's like the thick ones the thin ones the crispy ones the perf you know and they have spices in them some of them and but if i had a gun to my head and the last the one thing i if i could eat one thing um sweet it would be that it would be just really buttered thin french crepes that for me is it's also the first thing i learned how to do when I was, I was probably five, six, seven. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, in Paris, you have these crepe stands at every corner where, you know, you can have your egg and cheese and, and then you can have the Nutella ones. And, and, and I, I just wanted to replicate that at home. So that would be my sweet dish on a savory note. Um, it's, it's a little, I think it's, it's my mom's signature fete, which is a, it's a very traditional Syrian. It's a, it's a savory yogurt dish, so you can have it. It can be vegetarian, so it could be aubergine um, or chickpeas. And it's it, it's layered with this garlic tahini yogurt lemon sauce, and it has crispy red. It has different kinds of textures. Um, so I think that would be my savory bit. But on the sweet bit, yeah, I, I'd have to go for a very simple French crepe. So... Um, I this is this is kind of crazy, but when growing up in Ireland. So we didn't have pancakes like um, American pancakes. We had our pancakes were crepes and my mom. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. We, we had, and we called them pancakes because that's all we knew. There was no such thing as an American pancake. We just right. had crepes and they were our pancakes. So we have pancake Tuesday, which, um, is in February, um, every year, I think. And pancake Tuesday is the day before Lent. 
So it's it, what they call here in the United States, Fat Tuesday. And that's when you would uh, kind of like, for want of a better word, gorge or stuff yourself with all your favorite things. In Ireland, that was called Pancake Tuesday. You would go home from school and your mom would make pancakes for dinner. And my mom, uh, it was always crepes, um, very thin crepes, sprinkled with sugar, squeezed with lemon. And it's the simplest thing in the world. And even describing it to somebody, like it doesn't, it doesn't sound exciting, but um a little bit for you, um, I'm guessing it evokes those food memories for me. And it, it literally transports me right back there into my mom's kitchen. There was five kids in my family. We used to stand in a line. My mom would have a pan going. She would do a crepe. One person would get it. They'd go eat it. And then everybody would line up and get their crepe. And then you'd, you'd sit down, eat your crepe, then line back up again to get another crepe until the batter was all gone. And I... I love that recipe so much that I put it in my cookbook. And I remember when we shot my cookbook and on set, the uh, Kate Martindale, who is my stylist and uh, the photographer and, and everybody were like, these are gorgeous. This is so amazing. Like, and they were like, why are you putting lemon juice and sugar on it? I don't really get that. But it's so simple and just, uh, it's one of life's like simple pleasures. I absolutely adore it. And I, and I definitely, I plan on doing that for George because some from my childhood, I think this applies to a lot of people from my childhood. My food memories are my happiest memories. So creating those for George now being an American baby, but having, um, a bit, you know, being, I don't know, like half Irish and Ireland is going to be a big part of his, um, his growing up and his future and everything that, um, you know, I want him to have those kinds of same things. And it's so simple yet so amazing. So that's so funny that you should say that. And uh, yeah, it's, it's we, we do the same. So I do this for my three kids. Exactly. So they line up and they all. Have, and, and the thing is, I actually enjoy them so much. So I eat them as I'm making them. So you have to really speed it up because or else, you know, it's that little little piece of fried dough that you know is eaten in a second and yeah. uh, and I mean we end up going through about 40 of them and it's and absolutely <laughs> for dinner we do them so we have a tradition we do them Saturday for dinner Saturdays um we, you know everybody gets a savory one so usually it's a you know cheese ham turkey whatever and then there's always a sweet one um but yeah those are I I, I think you're right it's just those foods that evoke these memories and I think that's probably why people love food so much. It's not just yeah. the actual food. Is that, you know, the scent and sight, it just brings, it's like music. You know how music, a song brings you back? It moves I you. I think so does a bite. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I agree. Lots of people, you know, I don't know if you find this, but lots of people ask me, uh, do more Irish recipes. Can you introduce more Irish foods to us? And it was like, I can, but I kind of choose not to. And I'll tell you why, like they're not glamorous. Like rhubarb crumble is rhubarb, sugar, butter, and flour. That's what a crumble is. That's all it is. Um, it tastes amazing. And I, I just adore it. But like, um, you know, it, it's done in a big dish. It's baked. You scoop it into a bowl. It, it's it's hard to photograph stuff that's like scooped and soft and everything. And it's just, and everybody, everybody keeps asking me for it. I was like, it just doesn't always translate very well. I have an emotional connection to these foods, but you don't yet. Uh, so I always think it's not going to play out. However, um, I, uh, have started to do more very traditional Irish recipes and, uh, in the U S especially with our, our U S audience who have some sort of a connection to Ireland, they just blow up and they go nuts. So it's, it's, it just reminds me like it's, it's a very important for me to share that little bit of who I am. And I, um, appreciate where you're coming from because, you were born in the Middle East, but then raised in Europe. And it sounds like as you got older, you really start to appreciate where you came from. And yes, I, it's, not it's, a day goes by like, that I'm not very thankful. 
I, I think it's uh, it's a it's a wonderful thing to be, you know, to see you really embrace, you know, your your Irish background and also appreciate your new chapter of life, which is the U.S. And I think, I, I, you know, I, that's what I'm hoping I can. I can kind of pass on to my kids. So you are who you are. And, you know, every place that you live in becomes becomes part of you, but it doesn't take away. At the end of the day, my home, no matter, so I'm, you know, I'm British and German by nationality. I don't even have a Middle Eastern national or a Syrian nationality. I don't, so, but, but my home and my parents, you know, they, you know, the language at home, was actually half German, half Arabic, but I think you kind you don't lo- you don't lose that, and preserving it is just you know an extra layer of of depth to a person. You know that's how I look at it, and and so it's so nice to see that you you know you 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 hold on to that side. And and remember we were talking about um, I had just come back from Ireland uh-huh. um, recently when when we met which I thought was, you know, absolutely stunning. And I was mesmerized by the produce and the quality of the, the, the ingredients and, and how sweet and, and, and welcoming the people, the, the Irish people were. I mean, it was, it was a fantastic trip. It's a, it's a wonderful place. Yeah. I love that. I, I, I think, um, Personally, after listening to you and hearing a little bit more of your story, I think to I need to I need to get out more. And now that you know we're going to be able to travel a little bit more freely around the world, I definitely I want to I want to see more. I want I want to eat more. Um, Dahlia, tell me just this last thing because I've got a, a husband and a baby outside the house wanting to come in. Um, the the last thing, what? Uh, tell me something. About your, I'm going to put you on the spot. Tell me something about yourself that I could that I couldn't find out by googling you. Um, I'll give you I'll give you an example. I'll let you think about it while I give you an example of, of myself. I am so you know I love food. I love baking. I am a true crime like fanatic. I love true crime. So like, um, murder mysteries, um, like there's a, there's a, um, a TV channel here in the U S called Identi- ID called, I, uh, identification discovery crime shows 24 hours a day. Love it. Uh, my, the, my, my books that I read are true crime. Um, honestly, if you saw my, my search hit- history on Netflix, <laughs> <laughs> you, you would probably kind of question what kind of a person I am, but I just, I love it. I'm fascinated by it. And it's so, it's so opposite to what I do during the day. I just, I, um, I just get like caught up in all these stories and everything and they're shocking to me. It's awful, but I just, I just love to watch it. So what's something about that, you that I wouldn't, that I couldn't find out by Googling? <laughs> Well, you know, it's funny you said, so my, my husband calls me, like, he, he always tells me, you're like an old lady, because I love crime shows. And I don't love, I love the true crime. And I even like the cheesy crime shows where, you know, you kind of end up knowing who it is, um, the CSIs and so on. I, I enjoy them very much. So that is a guilty pleasure of mine. Um, what is, I will say, I don't, I'm superstitious which doesn't make any sense to me because I like to apply logic to things, but I look, I, I'm read, I'm very superstitious. So if, and the fact that I'm kind of between both worlds, I have all the superstitions, which is, yeah. so it's, my husband has a very hard time with me. Um, it's not necessarily that I believe it more than I tell myself, why take the chance? What if it is true? And uh, so it can be a little bit, a little bit, um, yeah, encumbersome to say the least to to go through the day with me because I keep seeing signs and feeling things, and, <laughs> and so I think yeah, that's 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 definitely something you wouldn't find out about googling. But horribly that's superstitious, funny. too much. That's funny. Um, that's hilarious. Yeah. I can imagine that in your day-to-day life that, that could slow things down a little bit. <laughs> yes, exactly. And it can be something is, you know, it, it can be something really silly. So yeah, it's, it's not, not a fun trait to have, but I do have yeah, it. Yeah. There, there could be worse though. That's, that's not a bad thing. <laughs> 
Dahlia, it was so lovely to talk to you. Thank you so much for spending time with me. And I, I hope um, our listeners learned a little bit more. I definitely learned a lot. And uh, you continue to amaze me. And um, I hope everybody follows you. Um, your Instagram is Dahlia's Kitchen. We'll put all this information as well. Thank you so much for having me. And, uh, and you know, look who's talking. You are absolutely wonderful, inspiring. I love watching your things. I love uh, watching little George now who's so blonde. I know you're blonde and, you know, your husband is too, but he's just extra blonde, is he not? He's, I don't know where I got this baby from. He has golden hair. It's, it's, and it's not changing. We're like, oh, it'll change soon. Right, it's like, no. And he's then we're so looking cute. at it the other that's day. It. I know. And we were looking at him the other day and Kevin was like, has it gotten lighter? Does it look like almost white? It's like, I don't, I don't know where this baby came from. <laughs> but uh, he has this gorgeous surfer boy, California blonde hair. So long, long may it last. And it's, it, his bangs are in his eyes now. So I've got to do something about it. Uh, but thank you, Dahlia. Well, bless, I put forth, bless him. And uh, thank you so much for having me. I um, hope to see you soon in, in, in real life. Thank you, everybody, for listening. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Dahlia. Make sure to like, rate, subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And Need to Know will be back again next week. Mm-hmm.